Good morning, my friends. My name is Lama Jigme Gyatso, the Tantric Buddhist monk, teacher, and healer. Well, I'm recording this teaching on the smartphone, as you can tell by the picture quality, because I'm answering a fielding, a wonderful question asked by my senior student during my Saturday morning class. Patricia, would you please tell me about the dream you told me of yesterday? I was walking in a forest and I came across three large mushrooms and a voice told me to uproot three middle poisons and victory is mine. So I decided to kick over the mushrooms, and when I did, they proliferated. Now, not everyone who's listening to this tape knows what proliferate means. Would you, uh, would you explain that a bit more? Uh, could you repeat that? I didn't hear it. Not everyone who is listening to the video knows what proliferate means. Would you please explain that? What happened in your dream when you kicked over one mushroom? It, uh, it produced hundreds of more, and the more mushrooms I kicked, the more mushrooms grew up out of the forest. Well, that sucks. Yeah. That, that kind of reminds me of Hercules' battle with the Hydra. Yeah. Every time he cut off one hand, two more came up, which was terribly inconvenient. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's very uh, frustrating. Yes, yes. So, I love your dream because it illustrates a very important Dharma point. And that Dharma point is wonderfully illustrated by the tantric element known as a Vajra. A vajra has five prongs at the top and a little handle five prongs at the bottom. The five prongs at the bottom represent the five mental poisons. Pat, do you remember what the five mental poisons are? Yes. They Wait. agree, hatred, confusion, jealousy, and pride. Perfect. And of course, at the top of the Vajra, the five prongs at the top represent the five wisdoms. And so, Yesterday, I asked you to consider what the relationship was with the five poisons to the five wisdoms. So, and it's okay to be correct or incorrect or puzzled, but at this point, what is your relation? What is the relationship between the five mental poisons and the five wisdoms? For each poison could be neutralized by each wisdom. Okay, so that's the traditional fundamentalist approach. And good effort, very courageous of you. However, when we look at the writings, the late writings of Patrul Rinpoche, we see a liberal perspective. Patrul Rinpoche is, was a late uh, Buddhist scholar and yogi. He lived about two or three centuries ago, closer to three centuries ago. And uh, as a young man, he wrote a text that many people are aware of. It's called The Words of a Perfect Teacher. And it's a very fundamentalist text. It's rooted in fear and rigidity and crankiness. Um, but as, an after, as the decades pass, Claude Boucher evolved beyond the fundamentalist perspective into the liberal perspective, into a more gentler, relaxed, hip, and groovy perspective. And so, according to some, his Opus Magnus, his greatest work as an aging liberal, was the heart treasure of the Enlightenment. At one point, he talks about 
the five poisons and how the, the antidote to each poison is simply the union of awareness and letting go. Being aware of that energy, being aware of those emotions, and letting go of them. And that gives birth to the five wisdoms. That reminds me of something that happened in China. I think it's the sixth patriarch. Uh, the, Patricia, are you familiar with his teachings uh, uh, about the selection and ordination of the sixth Sean Patriarch? That's not a clue. No problem, no problem. By the way, my lineage is Rimei, that means non-sectarian. That means I've stated the, the Theravadan teachings of Sri Lanka and Thailand and Burma and uh, Vietnam and Laos and Myanmar, as well as the Mahayana teachings of China and Korea and Japan, as well as the Tantric teachings or Mahayana teachings of Mongolia, Tibet, Nepal, and Bhutan. So in other words, I've been a busy boy. So this next story comes to us from China's Shan tradition. As the fifth Shan patriarch was ending, was coming to the end of his days, he was enthusiastic to find his successor, the sixth Shan patriarch. Now I might have the number num, numbers wrong, and if I do, I beg your indulgence. I took a blow to the side of my head, and my my memory is a bit wonky, but the ideas are sound. So the heir apparent, the people that all the monks wanted to be the, the successor for the fifth patriarch was very fundamentalist and pedantic and superficial and rigid. Was he a Republican? <laughs> <laughs> Anywho. Um, and so to test everyone's wisdom, The fifth, the aging fifth Sean Patriarch wrote a couple of verses. And the verses were, and I'm going to paraphrase them badly, Our Buddha nature is likened to a mirror with a great deal of dust upon it. All the monks were asked to write a follow-up set of verses. The heir apparent wrote something along the lines of, therefore we must polish the mirror diligently. Meanwhile, there was an unordained peasant who had a very simple practice. In fact, some people think his practice could have been as simple as either a pure land practice where on the in-breath he asked who was reciting the Buddha's name and on the out-breath he could have whispered uh, Namo Buddha Amitabha or simply Namo Amitabha. Other people said that it was most likely a Kuan Yin practice where in the in-breath he asked uh, he would mentally and silently recite Praise to Kuan Yin, or praise to Kuan Chi Yin, and on the out breath, or kind Kuan Chi Yin, and on the out breath, completely letting go. I favor that idea. I like it a lot. Praise to kind Kuan Chi Yin on the in breath completely letting go on the out-breath. So, it was a silent practice, very simple, but very powerful for a combined devotion 
with wisdom and an inferential recollection of the importance of compassion, kindness, and love. Somehow, the this little peasant, um, who is an ardent practitioner of a simple, simple dharma practice, came to the monastery of the sixth Chan Patriarch, recognizing that this humble peasant was to be his successor. He put him to work. He, the patriarch, put his protege to work in the kitchen, simply pounding rice. For at that time, they thought it was brown rice was for peasants and white rice was for the shishi folk, and so they tried to pound the brown off the rice. And I'm sure there is a commentary there somewhere, but we'll, we'll, ex we'll ignore that for now. When the little peasant was exposed to the patriarch's verses, our Buddha nature could be likened to a mirror that is quite dusty. And when the humble peasant was asked for his response, he said quite simply, there is no mirror, there is no dust. So the patriarch appointed him the sixth patriarch and his successor. And of course, riots ensued. For the less than spiritual monks decided they'd kill him. <laughs> now what I want to focus on is the contrast between the heir apparent's aunt follow-up and the sixth, patri sixth patriarch's follow-up there, parents said, therefore we must work diligently. Their parents said, there is no dust, there is no mirror. So we do not use the five wisdoms as an antidote for the five poisons. That would be the fundamentalist approach. Rather, we look deeply into our five poisons and our act of letting go of them gives birth to the five wisdoms. Patricia, could that make sense? Yes, that makes perfect sense. So, what happened in your dream is the voice was kind of like the voice of the fifth patriarch. And your response was an enthusiastic, fundamental response of, you know, I will kill the mushrooms. I will kill them to death. Yeah. <clears throat> Whereas a sixth patriarch would have said, um, simply explore the nature, the ultimate nature of the mushrooms. Or in this case, the three poisons. Or in this case, whatever emotional or intellectual affliction manifests. <clears throat> so, I'm going to get, now that's very theoretical and lovely, I'm going to bring it into the practical realm. Today I'm supposed to encounter someone who has been very aggressive and cruel and unstable in the past. And, um, it's very difficult to encounter this person. In the past, when I've encountered this person, in their aggression, in their instability, they uh, triggered my PTSD, and then I had a lot of physical challenges to deal with, including tachycardia and, and, and dizziness and the like. So it was rather unpleasant. Now, I was able to deal with it with the kind of use of supplements. I'm a big fan of CoQ Enzyme. Um, I think that's what it's called. And a big effort, I'm a fan of meditation, bringing the squirrely emotions 
know, into the path of awareness and letting go, as well as love and letting go. But still, it was it's very unpleasant, and I, I don't necessarily look forward to the encounter. And so, understandably, when I consider this prospect, um, what comes to mind is, or what comes to heart, is fear. And the best thing I can do with the fear is bring it into the paths of awareness and let it go. So I invite all of you who are watching me or hearing me at this moment to follow along in a guided meditation that will probably take a handful of minutes. So let's plug into our ring fingers and stack our hands. For nine breaths, let's play with the rhetorical contemplative question, where is fear letting go? The next several contemplations are going to be three breaths each, approximately. If you do a little bit more or a little bit less, that's okay. Let's not get too hung up on that. How could this fear be dependent? How could this fear never last? How could this fear not be me? How could this fear not be mine? How could this fear not be grasped? How could this be funny? Why grin now, releasing? Grin to fear, releasing. And we're going to do this for nine breaths.
noticing, relaxing. That is an extensive way of bringing fear into the path of awareness and letting go. Does that stop the person who's threatened to come over today, come over? Probably not. Is that going to make that person wiser? Most likely not. Is that going to make the person more rational? Nah, not so much with the rationale. Is it going to make them more peaceful and loving? Eh, I'd like it, but I wouldn't bet on it. So, regardless of the circumstance, through the kind of use of wisdom, we're able to let go and experience the modicum of peace that can be described as the I in the center of the storm. The Monday night series of weekly webinars begins December 2nd. If you live in the greater Los Angeles area, then come to my venue. It's going to be very close to the intersection of Lancashire and Strathern in North Hollywood. If you don't live around here, then you can participate in my cyber venue, which is an auditorium in Skype. Now, whether it's cyber or real world, my venues are limited in size, so if you want to register, register quickly by using the LlamaJigme.com link below. And if you have any questions or comments or you simply wish to give me a cyber hug, then do so using the Facebook link below. May you and yours be healthy and happy. Om Namo Buddhaya. Bye-bye.